looking good. Man, look at the people uh, coming in. It'll be a crowd. It's good. All right, all right. Well, we are at the hour. And so I want to welcome you to another session of the AUS training series where all topics tie back to the key tasks identified in the AUS position description or PD. Since the PD says what we have to know how to do, this class series focuses on the skills and topics that speak directly to what the PD says. The idea is that if we can get the fundamentals covered, we'll do great things and get top shelf performance evaluations every year. In this class, we will look at a critical document that we use to buy things, the IGCE. And as mentioned, I'm Stephen Clements. I will be your guide through this topic. I spent several years in VA contracting, switched sides to the good life of being in AUS, and earned the highest certification in contracting, the FACC Level 3. And I encourage all of you out there to earn your FACCs, uh, whether it's a 1, a 2, or a 3, any of them is uh, good to have. And my lovely assistant and fellow WISNIC AUS, Martin Wallace, will be monitoring the chat and helping out because I might ask you some questions along the way. And I'll be happy to help you with your general questions. Now, if you have a question specifically for me, please let me know at the end of the class. And if you're just coming in, the class will be recorded for posterity and these slides will be made available after the class. I'll even show you where you can go get them. All right, so I like to define terms. Let's start off with, uh, with uh, defining what is an IGCE. Please put your answers in the chat. What does that acronym mean? I'm waiting. I hear you. Independent government cost estimates is mm -hmm. Sockway. John Dewey, uh, independent government cost estimate. Everybody's hitting it on, hitting a All nail right. on the head. Well, good, 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 good. Then this, uh, maybe this will be a quick class because y'all keep telling me, Steve, I already know this, but I guarantee you, I found some stuff that you might not be so familiar with. So uh, let's see if we can add some value to your day. All right, the intended audience for this class is the acquisition utilization specialist. However, all are welcome. And our task and purpose for this class are to task, familiarize the AUS with what goes into writing IGCEs. Our purpose in doing so is to ensure the AUS is properly equipped to independently research, calculate, and document usage and pricing data information. And our desired outcome from doing so is that attendees will learn how to develop IGCEs and write them. All right, we'll meet our task and purpose by looking at topics such as what does the AUS have to do with IGCEs? What is an IGCE? What information do we need to make them? What forms do we need to fill out? And as we go through the class, we will look at what the regulations and interpretive sources have to say, and we'll work an example together. So what is the AUS role regarding IGCEs? Please drop that answer in the chat. Why am I giving a class on IGCEs to the AUS job series? Why am I even doing this? William Locke says to review and advise on the IGCE. Mm -hmm. Let's see, more answers are coming in, but uh, to help advise from John Dewey, Jill Friend says IGCs are required for all service contracts. Mm. Uh, Deborah Lance says because we have to know everything about everything. Yes, <laughs> yes, I like that answer. That's a good one. Well, it sounds like we're getting some really, we got some very knowledgeable folks here on the topic. That's great. And so I checked the AUSPD to see what it had to say. Here's some key lines that I found. If you are an AUS and have not read the AUSPD, you absolutely should read it. It's uh, actually really, really interesting. And as we can see from the quotes, the AUS is supposed to be an expert at acquisition planning, of which estimating spending is a critical part. Our first duty as contract liaison charges us with developing supporting artifacts or the documents we give to contracting, including the IGCE. And besides reviewing proc 
um, sorry, procurement package documents, we must be able to independently develop this information. The knowledge requirement section makes its first appearance in this class by saying the AUS needs to have strong knowledge of cost and pricing information. All this stuff is relevant. And now why do we have that role? Well, in 2016, the AUS position was created to advise our customers on this and other topics. The VHA customer reference guide states that it is the customer who makes and submits IGCEs. The slide cites the CRG, but this is also found in the procurement guide. And if you've used force to submit a contract action request to contracting before, you will know that force requires IGCE data information before it can even send the action in. As our facility's resident contracting experts, it is our duty to use our expertise to help our customers fulfill their duties to get what they need from contracting. Another question, does writing the IGCE solely fall on us and our customer's shoulders? Or does anyone else have a role in writing IGCEs? Please put your answers in the chat. For example, does contracting share some of the burden? Martin, what are we thinking? I know we got a lot of brains out there. What are we thinking? Donald and Susie says contracting. Forgive me if I murdered your name. Uh, let's see. Annabelle Massey says combined. Jill Friend knows the customer's responsibility. William Locker, we should develop this during the market research process and contracting helps to round it out. Well, we got a variety of answers coming in. All right. Well, yep. if you think contracting has a role, you would be wrong. As the CRG told us, it is the customer's responsibility to make the IGCE. Your CO may ask for more information in your IGCE, but it's up to us to provide that, not contracting. Uh, as with defining the requirement, contracting is on the outside looking in. They don't know what it is you need, nor do they know how much money you have to spend. If you can find in the regulations or the interpretive sources where your CO is supposed to write IGCEs, I'll be surprised. And as a matter of fact, I might even send you a picture of my surprise face as a reward for finding that. Um, now, that's not to say a CO doesn't always take on some role in this regard, because I remember when I was a CO, I would often get like some stuff that was pretty unintelligible and I had to make it work. So sometimes a CO has to make it work but that's where it's incumbent on us to give them stuff so good that they don't have to take extra time out to do that and they can focus on doing their part of the equation. Um, and I bring this up because the IGCE is just as critical in defining the requirement as writing the PWS is. Because while the you know, performance work statement PWS states the specifics of the requirement, the IGCE gives us the scale of the need. And so what is an IGCE? I've mentioned it a lot before. Y'all gave your answers of what the acronym stands for. Well, we've hinted that it involves spending, but how's it defined? Well, the FAR and the VAR do not define it, but the procurement guide does. On the slide, you will see both IGCE and IGE listed. And these terms are generally used interchangeably, even though their meanings are slightly different. For this class, I'll refer to everything as an IGCE. And when we talk, but there's a few uh, important things that go into it, like cost and price. When we talk about cost, what we mean is how much does the vendor have to spend to give us what we want? Now, cost is typically used in the concept context of a product that has to be developed, like a non-commercial item or construction, and cost does not include vendor profit. And yes, the government wants vendors to make profits doing business with us. Uh, it's part of our uh, philosophy. Now, price is different in that price represents the vendor's cost to do something plus the profit they tack onto it. Now, since most of what we buy are commercially available off the shelf items, we usually talk about price. And the next question we'll answer is why are IGCs important? Well, the FAR tells us to make budget estimates for our acquisitions and to show how we came up with them. And the CRG tells us we need them and provide some details on how to do so. Now, speaking from common sense, our customers have fixed budgets to use and the money can run out. 
Each year, we have to make budget estimates that usually involve projecting exactly what acquisitions we plan to make. So we're already making these budget estimates. So when we make the requirements packages, we just change the name for that part of the budget to IGCE and we can keep going. And finally, your IGCE, getting it right is critical because your requirements dollar value determines what you and contracting can and must do in order to make the purchase you're trying to make. The that value, it impacts us on the customer side in several ways. First, it determines if we can meet the requirement on our own by using the government purchase card or not. If the dollar value is above the micro purchase threshold, we can't. We have to go to contracting. Second, if our requirements IGCE is under the vendor quotes we get, that might mean we went over budget. Can we still afford the thing that we need? If not, we'll either have to beg our bosses for the extra money and none of them want us to do that and they don't want to beg their bosses for the money or we have to do without the thing that we can't afford. Can we afford to do without the thing that we need? Can our veterans afford for us to do without? Third, if we have to send a requirements package to contracting, the IGCE value determines how we document the requirement. We have to use different versions of at least three forms depending on the dollars. There's two different market research reports for dollar values under 250,000. There's a streamlined market research report, which is four pages long. If we're above $250,000, you use a standard market research report, which is 15 pages long. There are three ways to document acquisition plans. If the value is above 7 million, we use the formal AP document, which is 27 pages long. If it's between one and 7 million, we use the simplified AP, which is five pages long. And if we're below 1 million, CRG 53121 says we can simply use the market research report. Now there's at least four different sole source justification forms, depending on the dollar value. And if you're doing leasing, there's even more. Now, dollar value determines what contracting has to do in several ways. One of the major sources of delays in contracting is the approval process of getting, you know, what we want to do to buy the things we need approved by the right people. Now, on the customer side, we were largely blind to this, um, but it does have real impact on our acquisitions. Here on this slide, I highlight three document approval processes, but there are more. And each approval process is broken down by IGCE value and who in contracting contracting has to approve it because of that value. For lower value contracts, it's usually the CO who approves the document, but all the others require higher, higher approving authorities. On this slide, I note how many levels above the CO each approver is. And for our planning purposes, every level above the CO adds at least one month to the procurement. Now, that's a conservative planning number in my experience, and it can go on a lot longer. By the way, each of these approval processes can stack on each other. They don't often run concurrently. So if you had a uh, sole source uh, procurement for, uh, say, your vision above $75 million, you get to tick off the boxes for uh, acquisition plan above $7 million, so that's your HCA approving it, it's four levels above the CO. Uh, because it's a sole source, for whatever reason, that has to go to the senior procurement executive for the VA, that's five levels above your CO. And because it's for your vision, you're looking at two million, you're looking at um, a separate approval from your senior procurement executive, that's five levels above the CO. You add those together, that's 14 levels combined. That could realistically represent 14 months just getting those documents approved. That's not counting anything else contracting has to do. And a lot of what contracting has to do has to wait for these things to be approved in the first place. Uh, so it makes a big difference. Uh, I also included links to the approver sources in the presenter notes, uh, should you want to see those for yourself. And IGCE value also dictates more than just who has to sign off on the documents. It's possible, it's possible we'll have to form an integrated product team for your acquisition. And that means you'll have to pull in people who want to spend as little time as possible working on the contract. So I doubt they'll, happy, they'll be happy to be there. And you get to have more meetings, fill out more paperwork and add time to the process. 
and, and in those meetings, you could get lucky and have people who love to waste time dither and get in the way, which adds even more time and frustration. And I've added a link to the policy memo that addresses IPTs in the notes. Now, there's some times that you can get out of doing IPTs, so I think it's uh, important for you to read that document if you haven't already. Dollar value also decides what kind of contract instruments contracting can use to meet our needs. For example, above the simplified acquisition threshold, your CO generally can't use the easier ordering tools offered by FAR Part 13. If we can't do things the easy way, that means we have to do them the harder way. Instead of using GPCs, micro purchases, purchase orders, and FAR Part 13 BPAs, we might have to do a FAR Part 12 C-type contract, FAR Part 16 IDIQ, or a FAR Part 16 BOA. Um, the IGCE value is also the main guidepost by which COs evaluate vendor quotes for fair and reasonable pricing. This directly impacts which vendor is chosen and the product you get. Again, to bring this back up, if the IGCE value is off from the range of quoted prices your CO gets on your solicitation, the question becomes, was your IGCE wrong or all the vendors wrong? And then it's important to know, well, how can you tell which one it is? That's why we need to do uh, thorough work up front. Now, what information do we need to write IGCEs? We've talked about how important they are, why we do them. Well, what, what do we need to make them? Right, we'll get into the key details on the next slide, but I want to bring up four points to keep in mind as we do so. It's called an IGCE because it is an independent government cost estimate. It is made independently by the government. We decide what our IGCE is, not anybody else. Contractors do not get to tell us what our IGCE is. Matter of fact, contractors should never even see our IGCEs. Now, one technique salespeople use when talking to a potential customer is to ask, well, how much do you have to spend? Let me see if I can get, uh, get you taken care of in your budget. Well, that's no fault of the contractor to ask for that, and no fault of theirs if the customer gives them the answer. However, it's a problem because while we want vendors to make money working with us, we also want to get great deals. We don't want to give away the store. And if vendors know how much we have to spend, they may magically give us quotes for that exact amount. So we won't save any money. Um, that's not being the best steward of our, of our uh, funds. And the quality of your IGCE will largely depend on the quality of your market research. And we'll talk more about that soon. But remember, everything from our market research report class because you should use it here too. And if you weren't weren't here for the market research report class, we do have those up on TMS as well as at the link I'll be giving you at the end of the uh, at the end of the class. So you can check those out. And finally, make sure that the things you price out in your IGCE account for the things you ask for in your PWS. The IGCE should capture the total anticipated price we'll pay for what we need. So we have to make sure it accurately captures those needs. So what information do we need? Well, there's four key pieces of information we need to make an IGCE, and I have them listed here. The first two points are data sets we can find if we look hard enough. And the second two points are data sets we'll need to make for ourselves. To speak to the first question, how much have we spent on this in the past? There are several sources I check, but there may be more that you use. At a minimum, I comb through these three bullets we've got on the slide. First, I look at how much my previous contract was, um, you know, if I have one, if it's something that we actually have a contract for, that's a great place to start. And if you can take a look at not just the contract you're looking to replace, but the contracts that came before it. Is there a trend of increased or decreased spending across the years? Second, a lot of facilities have multiple contracts for the same item because the different departments have the same needs, but they don't talk to each other. They live in their little silos and make their own contracts, which create inconsistencies in terms, service, and pricing. And it creates more administrative burden, administrative burden and lowers our chance of securing better pricing because we're not leveraging our buying power by breaking it up into these uh, smaller contracts. And so I encourage you to ask around uh, because your coworkers might have contracts of interest to share. Now, I also search FPDS because FPDS might show me those contracts. 
However, FPDS does not capture government purchase card data. If you have a friendly supply system analyst nearby, you can ask them to run a GPC report. Mine has helped me get a more complete picture of Wisnik uh, uh, purchasing. And um, uh, that's both in the GPC realm as well as in, in, in uh, using contracts to supplement what I'm able to find on my own. And so it'll do the same in helping you better capture your facility's true usage. Uh, also, if your customer is using GPCs to buy items on a known repetitive basis, according to the uh, purchase card manuals, you're supposed to make a contract to cover that need. Now, are there other places you look for historical spending information? If so, please drop them in the chat so we can check those out for ourselves. And I want to show you how to mine FPDS for, date, uh, for spending data. And then, in case you hadn't seen one before, I want to show you a government purchase card report I've got. And so you can see what that looks like and what kind of data I might get off. That'd be just a moment while I switch screens that I'm sharing. All right, so here we are at FPDS. We've been here in a few classes before because this thing is very helpful. And let's see. What we're going to do is we're going to take a look. I've got a, a sample for us to look at um, Stryker. Stryker is an important company in the healthcare industry. Um, I could have picked any number of other uh, companies to do it, but uh, this is the first one that came to mind. And also because I've been working on patient bed pa uh, requirements packages recently. So this is one I've seen. All right, so we put Stryker in and what I'm looking for are Let's let's go ahead and define what it is I'm looking for. Well, I work for the WISNIX Western States Network Consortium, and I make packages that cover VIS in 17, 19, 20, 21, and 22. Um, so I'm in the VA, and we've got 18,406 entries we could search through, and some of these, well, this is for like Defense Logistics Agency. Is that really relevant spending to me? No. But over here, we see the department full name right at the top there, Department of Veterans Affairs. But 13,000 entries, well, that's smaller than 18,000. So let's do that. Let's take a look there. All right, so all 13,000 of these entries that are going to go page after page after page uh, are now available to me. Well, if I'm looking for contracts relevant to my service area, then going through eight or 13,000 plus of these by hand will uh, the, not be the most mission effective way of doing it. But what I can do is I can click on this CSV button up here and it's going to download, it's going to export this data as a CSV file, which I can easily turn into a uh, Excel spreadsheet. Then I'll be able to sort and filter through all that data so much easier. So let's see what we get. It's downloading now. And frankly, this is one of the first things I do when I start exploring a topic is I come here and just see what's what's been going on out there. Uh, because not only is it going to give me an estimate or it's it's going to give me what we've got for contracting spending. Um, over time and in the areas I'm interested in, but it's also um, going to give me the contract numbers. If I want to look those up and go mining around inside those contracts themselves to see what I've got to see um, so I can steal their good ideas and or improve on the work that they did to uh, make my own package. So this, this serves a lot of purposes here. And be just one moment while I share switch over to sharing that. Okay, search results. All right. So I know it's an Excel spreadsheet being shared online, so it might leave a little something to be desired as far as attractiveness, but I want to show you what these things look like, and I'm making this to where I can see what's going on. Now, there's a few data fields I go ahead and get rid of that never have information I'm interested in, like transaction number. I don't care what that does. Solicitation date, eh, usually don't use that. Well, I know this is for the VA, all these entries, so I can go ahead and cut out these two columns as well. 
All right, so try to winnow down what's important to me. So right now, I'm look, you generally look five years in the past. Uh, and so date signed would be important to me. Like, you know, when was this thing made effective? Uh, as well as I'm looking for my region of interest, just like you would say if you're at the Memphis station, well, this, this right here might be of importance to you. But what I'm going to do to start off here is I'm going to sort and filter this, hold this to newest, and we've got entries going back to 2003. Well, that's not really what I want. And I'm going to go back to 2017, cut those things out. Cut out all the stuff before 2017 because I deem it too old, but maybe it would be useful to you. And so that's going to save me about 6,000 entries of having to look through right there. Now that I've got down to just the air, just the time period I'm interested in, now I'm going to take a look over here in contracting office name, and I'm going to sort and filter that to cut out the areas maybe I'm not interested in. Like, you know, while NCO one's a, a cool place and Vizin one's a cool place, I'm not making a contract package for y'all. So this uh, two four one that is for NCO one. So I don't need that one. I could cut that, uh, but let's see what we got here. Cut that out. There's NCO2. I don't need that one so much. NCO4. Don't need that one so much. Five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. 10P. Interesting. 10P. So that is probably their prosthetics office. So that, you know, just taking a look at how the ordering office is described might tell you some things about uh, whether there's a consolidated effort going into buying things or are there different departments buying things? And is there is there something that could be of value to you in exploring that? Like maybe they could get together and do a uh, single contract instead of ordering a bunch of different ones, maybe. All right, so we've got now our two NCO 17. And there's 19, 21, 22. And then, oh, what's this? Now we have Ann Arbor. We get individual stations uh, coming out too. And we have two different entries for Ann Arbor. There's the station itself, and then there's the prosthetics department. Um, once again, maybe there's an opportunity for consolidation going on here um, that could be of use to, uh, to your planning purposes. And another thing to mention to scroll back up just a little bit. So taking a look at this one right here, we're just grabbing one. So we have a task order off of an IDIQ, and this was placed by NCO 22 because the 262, that's the code for uh, the contracting office for Vision 22. I don't know what station this is for, though. I don't know what facility this is for, in which case I might need to go back into FPDS, look this up, and then it'll be able to tell me that information. And then that'll help me winnow down the information that's relevant to me and what I'm trying to do with my package. Um, so hopefully giving you this, this uh, brief orientation about how you whittle down the information available from FPDS to something more specific to your need might, uh, might benefit you in the future. And now that we've taken a look at what you can do with FPDS, let me pull up that government purchase card report. And we'll take a look at that. And it's important to look at both if you can, because sometimes on these government purchase card reports, it's caught stuff that FPDS wasn't showing me and not just the fact that FPDS doesn't uh, usually doesn't record uh, government purchase cards, but it might also find uh, when your systems analyst is doing this report, it also might find contracts that you didn't, you weren't expecting or the FPDS didn't show you. Now, why did it do that? There's any number of coding reasons that might happen, but um, uh, quality check in your data is important. So here we have, um, what do we got? Repair of beds. So this is bed repairs for patient beds. And here we've got the station the station number, which visit it's in, which location, so the Amarillo Hospital, what was the PO number, if I need to go into Vista and find that out, who was the vendor, when did they buy this, what fiscal year was it, 
and then the comments that the customer left in their uh, purchase card request um, as well as a description and there's all kinds of ways that your customers might detail uh, what the situation is like here repair of a bed won't inflate or rotate so they included what was wrong with the bed along with the ee number the serial number so there's all kinds of information about the bed that's being discussed here maybe that's useful maybe it's not and scrolling over we also get all right how many repairs did they order what was the unit of purchase you see a bunch of jobs here so i mean that makes sense it's a repair job how much did it cost um and uh, then some uh, number crunching i was doing over here to get, add all that up to see how much money did we spend over this period of time in this area on patient bed repair orders made using a government purchase card request? So that that was useful in informing uh, my IGCE when I sent it in. Could be useful to you too. I mean, 264,000, that's a lot less uh, in dollar value than what I had on contracted spending, but 264,000, that's significant and that could make a big difference. Um, and what we have to do and how we need to plan for meeting this requirement. All right. Let me get us back to the slides. Okay, moving on to the second question on our list. What were the price elements we used in the past? A good thing to ask first might be, what is a price element? You know, price elements are the particular items we want prices for. And I call them price elements because if you remember all the way back to nine slides ago, a cost is what a vendor spends to give us what we want without adding in profit. Remember also that price is the vendor's cost plus their profit. Since we rarely do cost analysis, we don't need cost elements, but we do price analysis since most of our stuff's commercial off the shelf items. So we do, uh, we need price elements. Now on the slide, I list several sample price elements, There's, but there's many more. Uh, once we have these elements priced, we can add them up to make our IGCE. So you see equipment, uh, how much does a particular piece of equipment cost? That's a price element. Labor, what is the uh, price for one hour of this service technician's labor? Um, how much does delivery cost? How much does a, a mask cost for a supply item like per, per unit or per box or per mask? If there's any different number of ways you can arrange your price elements. Um, and which ones did your old contract use? Make a list so you have somewhere to start. And you may add or drop elements, but the old ones can help guide your work in what you're doing next. And where can you get price element ideas and data? I provide a list of sources I've used on this slide, but are there sources not listed here? If there are that you've been using, um, please drop them in the chat so the rest of us can also take advantage of what you've been doing. And you'll notice that this list has a lot in common with our market research source list, and it should. Before making an estimate, you should mine these sources for ideas on which price elements best capture your requirement, what those prices should look like, and what you can learn about the market by looking at what others have done. At the bottom of the list, I list vendors as a good source of information. They are, but you should be careful in what you say to them. When you talk to them, state you're only conducting market research and do not promise them anything. As we said, do not share our IGCE or the specifics of your requirement, just the generalities, because the specifics of a requirement might give them an unfair advantage when it comes to quoting, because they had that knowledge ahead of time. You're just asking for their pricing structures. You know, like how much do you generally charge per labor hour for your technicians? How much do you generally charge for this piece of equipment? Um, not giving them specific configuration, but just something to give you an idea what they're talking about. You're, and if a vendor can't give that information to you, that's a good indicator they aren't a responsible vendor for that item because vendors customarily involved in providing an item know what their prices are and can tell you what their pricing structures are. Those who don't are middlemen looking to get their cut and will have to go ask the actual provider of the items to find out the same as you. 
Uh, so now that you know where to look for historical pricing data, is that information relevant to what you're currently doing? When you look at historical pricing and previous price elements, here are questions that may improve the quality of your analysis. You may decide some historical data is no use to your current effort. But I assure you, the more you think through your acquisition, the better your understanding of the requirement will be and the better you can serve your customer. Now, subjecting historical price elements to this test will help decide which price elements you want to use for the next acquisition. And this also conveniently addresses a third question from our list. Our fourth question to answer takes us into the next phase of our project of writing the IGCE because we need to determine what our future spending could be. So how do we do that? Well, how do you figure out what our future spending will be? I'm glad I asked because by using the four planning elements listed on the slide, we can do just that. The first thing we need to decide on is what framework will we use to develop our IGCE? This is the philosophy of how you develop and explain your future spending estimate. The CRG lists the three methods listed on the slide, which are professional judgment. You happen to be an expert on the item that you're trying to buy and believe you can guess an accurate IGCE value. Yes, I said guess. Reasoned analysis. You use known information and reason your way to project an accurate IGCE value. Or quantitative techniques. You use math and numbers to determine your IGCE value. Well, here's examples to help illustrate those different approaches. Uh, professional judgment, because you're an expert, right? Based on my 20 years of experience with this requirement, I estimate the IGCE to be $585,000. And that's as deep as that goes. Because I happen to know this stuff and uh, that's as far into it as I need to think. Reasoned analysis. This new equipment works 30% faster than the unit we bought before, which cost $450,000. Therefore, we can expect to spend 30% more for a total of $585,000. That's reasoned analysis. Then there's quantitative techniques. We need 100 items priced at $100 each, but the CPI, or Consumer Price Index, says prices increased by 10% last year. To be safe, we should budget $11,000 instead of $10,000 to avoid that, uh, to avoid price risk. Um, as you can see, and this, this is going back to the CRG, it, it backs me up on this, neither professional judgment nor reasoned analysis rely on sophisticated quantitative techniques. They are guesses. They might be well-informed guesses, but they're still a guess. I prefer quantitative techniques because they allow for greater precision and encourage more detailed thinking, which will benefit your requirements package. And as we get closer to working our in-class example, We'll keep a running list of the factors we're going to use to do it. Now, regardless of which method you use, every approach involves assumptions. We all make assumptions, including me, when I assume we all make assumptions. Identifying to ourselves which assumptions we make helps us decide if our assumptions are the right ones to use. Once we know what they are, we need to identify them to help explain our spending estimates so others can check our math and see if our estimate makes sense. On the slide are some assumptions we might make, such as we'll actually use the number or we'll actually use the items that we're ordering. It's possible. I've seen it before where customers place an order for something, they set aside money and then don't use it. And so it was all for nothing. And we might assume we'll actually use the item quantities anticipated. Uh, we anticipated we need a thousand widgets and we are assuming we'll actually use a thousand. Now, that doesn't always come true. Sometimes you use less, sometimes you use more. And it's important to try to get that as right as you possibly can. We're, we might also assume that our price elements will be comprehensive, that they will accurately represent all the price, uh, uh, the, the, the prices that go into what is what it is that we're uh, ordering and all of the items that we're trying to order. And we might also assume that the prices that we come up with in our IGC will be representative of quoted prices um, 
that uh, you know we 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 think will be close to what the vendors are actually going to quote to us in the solicitation, and we might also assume that the consumer price index will be accurate when it comes to forecasting what future pricing may be. Now, in case you're not familiar with that last one, the consumer price index, which got mentioned uh, uh, twice now, it's a set of price indices made by the Federal Bureau of Labor Statistics that aim to measure price fluctuations by commodity type across the country and over time. This measurement of market forces could influence your future price elements. So we'll add those assumptions to our list that the CPI will apply, that our quantities and price elements will be accurate and quotes will be competitive and close to the pricing that we're assuming uh, to make our estimate. Now, before we decide which price elements we should use, it behooves us to know what our requirement is. This may look familiar if you've been to these classes before, as a refresher, our hypothetical, completely not based in reality requirement is for breath freshening products because a fictional study found that the AUS job series and everybody in it have really bad breath and it bothers our customers. Even if you're working from home, they can still, your customers can still somehow smell it and it, it's, it's bad. Now, to improve our customers' experience of working with us, we need breath freshening products such as Tic Tacs. This slide briefly defines our requirement and shows the market research details we may need to make an IGCE. And here are the price elements I could find using that example. We got breath freshening products, we got shipping, we got biodegradable shipping, packaging, all those things came in our uh, requirement definition. Now, I could not find price information while doing market research for biodegradable shipping packaging, so we can keep an eye out for that data and see if we can find it as we work uh, through the package. But until we find better information about whether the marketplace prices packaging and shipping separately, we'll just assume the packaging cost is combined with shipping into a price element known as delivery fee. So. Here's our updated list. Our two price elements are for the breath fresheners themselves and the delivery fee to get them to us. All right, since our 300 AUSs need one Tic Tac every two hours for six months, I made an equation to calculate how many individual Tic Tacs we need. That's our breath freshening units. And below that, we find how many delivery fees we need to account for to get all those Tic Tacs to us. And I show my math there. And with those quantities in hand, here are all the details we will need to use to calculate our IGCE. Here we show the math of how we arrive at our estimated price per price element as shown here. Since I assumed the consumer price index will accurately predict the price increase in the market, I show the CPI's reported price increases. We apply those annual increases to the price element totals and I rounded the numbers to get whole dollars. All considered, we have an estimated IGC value of $37,130. This by itself might suggest ways you can change your PWS to save money because right now our delivery fees are priced per individual pack of 38 Tic Tacs. So that is the price of, for a vendor to send us one pack of 38 Tic Tacs at a time. Could we look at packaging multiple packs per shipment and save money? Cut down on that uh, delivery fee, possibly. There's all kinds of ways you could uh, work with this information, and there's a bunch of different lessons that your IGCE can show you uh, that can potentially help shape your requirement. So we've got an IGCE. We've got, you know, we've got our numbers. Now, which official form do we use to record that? Well, there's not one. The CRG does add pointers if you're doing architect engineer contracts, and it does have some suggested forms you could use, but there's no mandatory form or format by a big VA. We could use whatever documentation we choose to 
or that your particular NCO requires, because they can do that. But however we do it, we need to cover the key details in a way other people can understand. I like using Excel spreadsheets because their math capabilities make number crunching easier. They also make integrating things like that government purchase card uh, report I showed you and FPDS reports uh, into a bigger Excel spreadsheet so I can make them all into individual tabs instead of having to keep track of separate files. I can put them all in one place so I can show my math uh, using all my different references in one spot. However, the slides we made in this class could serve as a perfectly proper IGCE. And I want to show you a couple things. First, the consumer or the CPI website and one of my recent IGCEs. First, we're going to go to the Bureau of Labor Statistics website, link in the presenter's notes to show you where you can get the monthly consumer price index reports. And let's blow this up a little bit. Make it for you to see. Come on. Come on. All right. For some reason, it's not going to let me do it. So this is what it looks like. And as I mentioned, this address is in the presenter's notes, so you can use this for yourself. And every month these get updated. Now they generally get updated um, for the previous month at roughly the midpoint month of the month uh, you know the, that you're in. So, um, so we're in June, and so the May report is available. Uh, however, at the beginning of July, the June report will not be available. You generally have to wait a couple of weeks for all the information to get uh, collated. And there's a number of different ways you can get at this data. However, I usually go right over here, news releases, and I don't click on this, but when you get down here, you got different ways you can access the report you're looking for. Um, the HTML I find to be an eyesore, so I usually download the PDF because it's it's formatted differently and I think it's easier to follow. And I've got the most recent one open to show you what it looks like. And there, as you can see, there's 37 pages. There's quite a bit to it. Um, you don't need all of it. Um, and usually what I need, I skip past that first page. Here's the big picture of, of like uh, macro sectors of the economy that uh, and what what kind of price increases or decreases they found you get here by month. I'm usually interested in this one, a 12 month, uh, a 12 month average of what the well, a 12 month projection of what the price uh, increase or decrease has been. And an important one for you might be medical care services. So you can see under the services category, services minus energy services for medical care services over or from May of 2021 to May 2022, there's been a, a projected 4% increase in the price of medical care services. That might be useful to you. Now, there's also medical care commodities, and that has gone up apparently 2.4%. Now, if you look at uh, fuel oil, 106.7 percent uh, that's uh that's a bit spectacular i've i've been looking at these things for a few years but uh that one's uh that one stands out so you can these are your big picture percentages however you can keep going down and get more detail about each category and depending on what you're trying to buy that might be more useful to you however these uh charts also get progressively more detailed so you see here food well you've got cereals meats dairy all kinds of different stuff here and additional categories get broken down here so i would go for what's the closest fit to the requirement you're getting uh, or that you're trying to buy but there's nothing wrong with just going with the the overall sector that you think it's in um, and running with that so be just one moment and I'm going to show you a recent IGC I did show you what mine look like. Bear in mind, yours may not need to be so complicated because you might not have five visions to keep track of. Um, but I'm sure there's some ideas in here that will 
uh, be beneficial to you. So I've got tabs arranged all across the bottom and I like to be bottom line up front to my CEO and first tab IGCE. What is it? You know, what is what's the value I'm projecting? And so this is for bed purchases. Now, this, I think this is an older version. Um, I've updated it since uh, since then. Um, or I've, I've put in an update since then, so this, this won't be 100% uh, accurate, but it'll give you an idea of what it would look like. And I'm telling my CEO, I expect we'll, in the Wisnick area, we'll spend $4 million a year on buying patient beds. And then because I wanted to be a five-year uh, contract, I put in uh, 4 million per year, comes to 20 million. Well, you might be asking, what if the prices go up? What if the prices go down? Why do you... Why do you assume it's going to be a constant four million a year? Well, here I put explanation of why uh, I came up with that. Not only did I use total historical usage or purchasing in the Wisnick area for this, um, however, I had rounded that up for ease of accounting, um, and I also didn't uh, include escalation because it is inevitable that no matter how good my Wisnick BPA is, somebody out there is not going to use it so i'm not going to capture all possible purchases for patient beds uh and they'll make their own and so i don't include escalation in this however that's something you might want to do um and then here i've got a breakdown of what has been bought and how it's been bought um over the past five years for patient beds and i've got it broken down by uh manufacturer by which contract that it was on um, for, this was a GSA FSS contract. Well, what about for contract activity that wasn't covered by that? Well, I got a separate chart for that and I got it by different manufacturers. I got it by different visions. And then I've got roll-ups per visions, a total number of orders that they had. How much did they spend? What were the averages? What were the averages uh, per task order and averages per year? This information might be useful for you to have. Um, I also referenced the uh, Northeastern Consortium uh, had made a series of BPAs for patient bed purchasing. So I went and looked at how much were was a comparable entity, another consortium spending on this. And over two years, this is the kind of information I was able to find because it might help me quality check my estimate. Um, and because, you know, we're similarly situated, maybe their needs are pretty comparable to mine. Now I've also got average price per bed by manufacturer. There's all kinds of information that went into that. Maybe that's useful to you um, because not only am I trying to figure out how much am I spent, how much am I going to spend overall, but I also need to know what a good price looks like per thing I'm trying to buy. And uh, here I collected a whole bunch of uh, uh, unit prices for different types of beds, frames here. We got mattresses. Uh, this is for Arjo. Then we got Hill Rom, same thing. Jerns, on and on. And then here's an example of me integrating in the FPDS reports and what information I was looking for there. Now you see some of these have different colors on them, and that means let's see, rentals are in green. So I didn't delete them out because this. Uh, because I want to want to keep this information around for whatever reason. Um, but I made sure to note to myself and to other people that if it's highlighted in green, then that's for rental, not for a purchase. There's uh, different ways that you could format the information to make it most useful to you, but I found that useful to me. And so these things can get as complicated as you want them to get and say this one. How many tabs does this one go on for? Yeah, all kinds of other 12 or 15 tabs. Now this is a, this is a big and pretty complicated requirement with a whole bunch of manufacturers. Um, maybe yours doesn't need to be that complicated. Maybe it does, but there's an idea of how you would do that. And if anybody would like to see, you know, see an example, I can uh, send it to you. Just let me know. And so let's get back to the slides and summarize some key IGCE takeaways that knowing usage and pricing, it's an AUS job. It's an important one. It's called out in our PD and that the IGCE is the customer's responsibility to make. 
and we should use the available guides, relevant examples, and deliberate analysis to best write them because the right IGCE best focuses our efforts and defines the scale of our requirement. And, and a well-made IGCE safeguards your budget and gets your customer the coverage they need, the items they want. And this is as much time as we have to cover this topic, but I do have some suggestions for future study. Uh, these three courses that I have listed, they involve different time demands and there's a variety to pick from. And starting off with AC, uh, ACQ0060, it's self-paced and online, takes about four hours to complete. And even though it focuses on services, the lessons it teaches works for any type of contract. So you can just take the principles and apply it anywhere you want to go. FQN402, it's a three-day instructor-led class, so you know it's more involvement. And finally, CON 170 is the longest and most intense course of the three, but it also covers the most ground. Um, and is also a requirement if you're trying to get a fax C certification. It's incredibly helpful. It made my head hurt, uh, but it will benefit you greatly to use it. Um, now, CON 170 also has several prerequisite classes, but if you pass it, you'll be well grounded in contract pricing principles. And now we're to my last question to you, my beloved, exceedingly good looking, and above average in every respect audience. Did you find that this class helped you learn for the first time or refresh your knowledge of IGCEs? If so, great. What did you find most helpful? Let us know. If not, what did we miss? What would have made this more helpful? We want to make these classes as useful as possible. And please put your answers in the chat or send us an email. Or we could talk about it after the class, which is coming up in just a second. And Martin, what are we, what are people thinking? Should we should we both uh, be fired in disgrace or uh, or was it okay? That that seems to be the general gist. Oh no, just, no. just kidding. Uh, no, actually, I've got uh, seniority to you first. I'm too. <laughs> 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 I'm they helped a lot of people, and everybody says thank you, and they enjoyed great. it, and they want us to keep doing these classes. Great, great, great. I'm glad to hear it. And uh, so Martin and I thank you for your time and we hope you got value out of the class. So this is what uh, this is the end of what I have to say about IGCEs. Um, so do you have any questions, comments or other discussions you'd like to have about this or anything else? Keep those ideas in mind or start dropping them in the chat because after I show you where the class slides will be found, I'll stick around for as long as we have things to talk about. It'll be just a moment. I will share the screen and share the link to the SharePoint of the Operations Planning and Readiness uh, group. And here you're going to see we've got all the classes we've done so far, along with recordings of each, and I believe some. Uh, additional information that might help you out. There's the link coming at you. And just one moment and I will drop the slides into the IGCE folder. And then you can have it for yourself. Wait just a moment while everything is loading. Now the folder is empty, but it's not about to be. Oh, wait, do I have permission to load this or do I need to get Kenneth or Simona to do it? OK, well, before the end of the day, this will have the slideshow as well as the recording for this session. Um, it might take a few minutes, uh, maybe about an hour for it to get loaded up, but we can definitely get you into that. And so. Oh. Another thing to point out is that while I don't give out a certificate, you can self-register in both TMS and Cornerstone On Demand to get a credit, a CLP for this class. When it asks for who gave the training or the instructor, just put my name and, uh, you know, Stephen Clements, you'll be good to go. There's a few simple questions. It's very easy to do, and I've gotten about half of my CLPs for the year by manually loading them into there. 
Um, and all right, well, that's all I got. And Marty, do we have any questions? Feel free to unmute your mics at this point, and uh, uh, we'll we'll talk for as long as we need to. If you need to go, it was good having you, and I uh, hope you have a great day. Thank you. You're welcome. Welcome.